Hello everyone and welcome to The Diff. Tonight I am joined by one of the founding fathers of this world of ideas that we call circular economy. The co-author of this book, Cradle to Cradle, a seminal publication and the foundation for much of the thinking uh, that has come since. A book that is also on nearly every bookshelf uh, here at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. My name's Joe Murphy, I am the C100 lead, and I'm delighted to be joined by Bill McDonough. Um, Bill, Cradle to Cradle was a genuine piece of original thinking, uh, and it's the result of a collaboration, your co-author, and the, it's really the fusion of two minds. So Bill, could you give us the 60 second story behind the origins of this book? Just imagine two intellectual vectors approaching each other across time. And Michael and I met in New York in 1991. And up to then, I started by being an architecture student at Yale. I built experimental solar house in Ireland myself. And then I went to New York and did the first so-called green office in New York, the Environmental Defense Fund. Then I did some competitions, which I won, one in Germany, one in Poland. And the German one was a daycare center. And I, I looked at the children as I was doing research, and I noticed they were eating the building. And I thought, you know, we really need to get into the materials as well as all the energy and the water and the things we've been doing. And I wanted to make buildings like trees so that were fecund and, and clean and healthy and, and productive. At the same time, I realized I wanted to, to talk to an ecotoxicologist. So I found... Michael Browngard and his name as being right there at the forefront of this. And so when I had a chance to meet him, I did. And Michael had been working on an astonishing set of ideas as a chemist uh, working in Greenpeace around safe and healthy chemistries, as well as products as services and uh, products that would go back to nature and biological cycles, back to industry and technical cycles. And the two of us just started a mind melt when we met, we were supposed to meet for a few minutes and we ended up uh, talking for 20 years. And in the meantime, <laughs> we wrote a book. Excellent. I would love, it's my aspiration one day to be referred to as an intellectual vector, but I think I've got some way to go yet. So tell us about some of the thinking uh, you know, behind this book, Bill. Um, I, I imagine some people joining online for, for the first time will need a bit of a kind of cradle to cradle 101. Well, Cradle to Cradle is obviously in a, in a, 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 as a build on the idea of Cradle to Grave. So since we were talking at the time mostly about industrial systems as being Cradle to Grave, and then people were doing a life cycle assessment and looking at what happens when Cradle to Grave, so a life cycle would say you end up in a you know, landfill grave or, a, or an incinerator, a crematorium. So this human projection of cradle to grave and that it's about life and products and things like that. We were looking at this and saying, wait a minute, what if waste equals food? What if we don't talk about end of life for design, but we talk about end of use? Because if you say end of life, then you say, okay, I've designed it and it goes somewhere and that's that. If you say design for end of use, then you realize this is a utile thing and that humans, this is a concept known as usufruct by the way, for those who love words. And usufruct is the word means that humans look at the world as being here for our use, to think for our use. And so if we have that mental model about certain things, then these things are for our use. Why would I say end of life of a thing I want to use? So that's what happened. We, we said cradle to cradle is really things that go back to soil and water and healthy ecosystems and things that can go back to industry ad infinitum. So that's really it. Cradle to cradle is things designed to go in cycles, the back to biology, back to technology, and not let them contaminate each other. That's your basic protocol. And then we add dimension to that idea by saying there are five steps in design of products. One would be safe and healthy first, because why would you recirculate things that aren't? Mm -hmm. Second, circular economy, realization, reuse, sharing, shared. Third, renewable energy, because it's much richer than just circulating, it's also where the energy comes from, how does it all work, clean water and good lives. So that's credit. 
And that emphasis on uh, design and material selection is, is critical, right? Just going back to your opening story about seeing the kids in the school eat the school. Uh, there's a really right. always been a strong emphasis on saying the materials, the chemicals that we put out there through our products uh, that we put on the market should be healthy, uh, should be healthy ones. Right, exactly. Job one. <laughs> and so where, ex where are some examples of, of you see this, this thinking manifesting? Where is, it, where is it happening? Well, you see it um, happening in pretty much the basic sectors of human engagement. We see it in business, certainly, because businesses probably should remember that job one is don't kill your customers. So that's a good idea. So you'll see certain people realizing that customers want safe and healthy things. And so we've had the pleasure of working with many co big companies and small companies alike, working on safe and healthy chemistries. And so there's a lot there. Um, so we see that, but really it, it gets to this issue of commerce as the engine of change. So we see commercial actors seeing this as a qualification of their business and an opportunity to communicate and, and be productive and engage with customers and, and consumers. And then you also see it in terms of setting standards. I think that's a really important thing because if we have industrial standards where the businesses and the, and the societies come together but have standards, then you have regulations. Regulations are really slow because they take a while. Society has to be worried about something first, then they have to explore it, they have to investigate it, they have to sort of work through it, all the issues of it. And the regulations can often take 10 years. I mean, the seatbelt was a pretty straightforward idea and it took 10 years to make it a law. So, you know, we all knew that a seatbelt was gonna help you and yet it takes 10 years to figure that out. So. You know, I think there's a, a lot to say about what process we're going to use to get this done, but we see commerce as the fastest, standards as the second fastest, mm -hmm. and then regulations as the third. And they're all important, and they help create level playing fields. And if those playing fields can be uh, positively described and, and uh, intentioned, they become productive systems. So we, we, what we want to be careful is that we don't end up with legislating uh, things that are simply efficiencies benchmarked against certain goals that are suboptimal to begin with, and, uh, and that these can be used as innovation engines. Mm -hmm. That's the part that's the most and, But just building on that, are there any kind of um, a, a tangible examples of where you have seen the, you know, uh, a product come on the market that really kind of lives and breathes um, the cradle to cradle principles that you, you were advocating in the early days? Um, yeah, it would be great maybe just to bring that to life through an example for some of the people tuning in for the first, for the first time. Mm. Well, you know, there's, one of the fun things about this is watching the examples come, and I can be really specifically related to the book itself because, uh, you know, there are people who have called me up and said, I read your book, and so, you know, I was inspired to start this company, and I'll give you a few of those examples. It's fun. Uh, one was um, Evan Beyer read it and started Ecovative. Ecovative makes packaging out of mushrooms and other things using uh, fungi and mycelium. So it's uh, Ecovative is a, is fun to watch because you know Dell uses it to pack computers instead of expanded polystyrene, and that grew out of Cradle to Cradle. And he read that and said, "This is." you know, biological nutrient packing. Why wouldn't we do that? So that's fun to watch. Um, we also see it in the technical area, Shaw Industries, which is now the largest um, in its sector, uh, number one, uh, flooring company. It, it, it had a few of their people said, you know, we've heard this, we've seen this. Why don't we redesign the nylon and PVC uh, carpet into something else based on these principles and designed it with uh, nylon six instead of six six into a backing that was thermoplastic polyolefin instead of PVC and, and something that could be shredded and come back to uh, chemical recycling for the caprolactam and physical recycling for and thermal recycling for the polyolefin. And then we can have the same materials going to the carpet streams out of finitum. So you're essentially storing your raw materials on your customer's floors and the materials are safe, which is a really elegant 
uh, example, an early one, and, and you know it's been used a lot to explain this because it's so straightforward. So there's two examples right there, and then we see Phillips. Uh, we talked about in the book, you know, what if lighting was a service? Well, guess what? Here it is. And so um, you know, when people get inspired and they do things, it's it's fun to watch. I mean, yeah, you know, the Ellen Mac you could say the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is an example of where it, it's the inspiration piece has worked because of where would where would we be um, without without the cradle to cradle thinking which underpins you know a lot of our work uh, which is now being amplified. Yeah, and I'd say that's one of the greatest privileges of this work is that when we see that we can say things can be in biological and technical cycles, and we see that being picked up, one of the great privileges of working with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is that that's a foundational part of, of, um, of the uh, circular economy from Ellen MacArthur's perspective, which is beautiful for us because we're, we're able to fit right into that and because that's how we think. And uh, the, the notion of products as a service, when we started putting that forward, we were accused of being communist because we didn't believe in ownership. And um, that's how, what it was like, you should know. And, uh, and it was also sometimes focused on performance and durability. And, and so people were designing things to last a long time so that the damage would be amortized over more years to reduce their ecological footprint on a per annum basis. But when you design the wrong car to last 25 years with good mileage, you're still perpetuating the internal combustion engine. And, uh, and maybe you won't have the same cars in 25 years. And so today, it's really become clear that we do have this strange aspect of objects that are quite durable designed to be ephemera. You, I mean, you don't buy your cell phone thinking you're gonna have it for 25 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the notion that we would actually design things for short use cycles, it then predicates that we design for disassembly, we design for reuse, we have systems to take things back and put them back into flow. So, um, so it's it's fun to watch all that. Uh, yeah, I bet. a design assignment. And uh, you touched on there this kind of tension between efficiency and effectiveness. And I, I'm kind of guessing that sometimes you're seeing these these ideas pick, being picked up and translated into eco efficiency, uh, whereas actually maybe that's missing the bigger opportunity of of kind of more effective systems. Could you could you unpick that tension between efficiency on the one hand and effectiveness on the other? Yes, of course. The, 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 uh, I, the drama of this in, for my life basically came from, you know, after doing a solar house in the early 70s and then doing this green office in New York and the, starting in the early 80s and then getting to the Earth Summit in 1992 where I delivered the Hanover Principles Design for Sustainability and being there and looking at all these companies and the, the one of the Focus ones was pollution prevention pays. It was one of the companies that saved $375 million on pollution prevention. And that's great, except we ask ourselves is, well, how much pollution were you doing before that? And if it's only a third of it or something, then, okay, now we only have, you know, 600 million more of pollution. So if you stop and think, wait a minute, is this, is this being more good or is this being less bad? And so, to be efficient, uh, in Peter Drucker's words, uh, the management consultant, was, is to be, you know, do something the right way. And having been born in Japan and being exposed to Deming and actually meeting him, W. Edwards Deming, who developed total quality management, the idea of statistical significance brought to production and super efficiency is really an important one. But what if you're doing the wrong thing? So if we're polluting the ocean and we do it a third less, we're still polluting the ocean. So then the question is, am I doing the wrong thing the right way? What if I do it perfectly? Well, then maybe I'm perfectly wrong. So what would it mean to do something the, the right thing first? Then we do it the right way. Mm. So that would be effective in Drucker's language. So that's really the question for us. It became, how do we characterize this as eco-effectiveness? Let's do the right thing first, and then let's do it in an efficient way, so we can do more of it and it can be profitable and competitive and all those things. So really it's that order of business. But it does always start, you'll see people 
typically start by saying I'm going to be less bad and I'm going to benchmark against the current benchmark and I'll have 20% less energy than, than, uh, than this other option or whatever. I'll reduce some toxins. And, uh, and that's a, a great place to start. Mm -hmm. But if, if, that's, if it's only benchmarking and trying to be less bad, it's, it's missing the opportunity to be fabulous. <laughs> so, so, you know, go for the, go for fabulous. It'd be hundred percent good. And then let's figure out, you know, how to be less bad on our way there too. But so don't, well, there's the message. Don't go stop being go less for bad. fabulous. That's the, uh, that's the key message. I once heard an American describe it as, um, you, you don't get to Canada by driving more slowly to Mexico. And uh, I thought that, that was actually, quite... that's one of my quotes. Oh, there, you, well, there you go. That's the, you're putting it out there and it's kind of circling around. So it's funny. I've had two things. That's one of them. <laughs> where I said, if you're going hundred miles an hour toward Mexico and you're supposed to be going to Canada, you know, it doesn't help you to slow down to 20. You got to turn around, you know? And so that one got picked up and became a meme. The other one was uh, design that design humility is really important. And if anybody has trouble with design humility, they just have to remember that it took 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. And, uh, you know, we're not that smart. And, it, and we actually didn't put wheels on our luggage until after we had been to the moon, which is interesting. And then it took us another 20 years to put four wheels on the luggage. So we're, we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's progress. It's, it's funny because yeah. when, you, you know, when you put it like that, the idea, a lot of the thinking... It does sound so simple, and yet when you put the, the book out, it was a groundbreaking idea. Why do you think we've, we missed it for so long? I think it's very hard uh, in a strange way, as somebody at a university <clears throat> just told me. Because he, he had read the book, and, and they're using it to teach rhetoric at the university in the English language. And it's an English university, which is nice. But it was... He said, the thing that's going on here is that you've discovered the obvious. And that's always a strange thing. Because so you end up reading this book, and at the end you go, well, this is obvious. And then you realize it wasn't obvious at all before you read the book. So what is that? <laughs> and so it is a strange thing, because to us it's just obvious. Of course, why? we want to make safe, healthy things. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? Um, but why is that not obvious to everybody? I don't know. I don't know. And uh, I, w I just wanted to pick up on that piece. It is, it is obvious, you know, at the highest level. But it, when you think about the application, uh, it's, it's complex. And it's, it can be riddled with kind of unintended consequences. And you mentioned the combustion engine there uh, when you were talking about efficiencies. I want, um, could you, um, you know, evolve that thinking a little bit? Maybe where we are seeing... Um, circular economy practices applied in the mobility sector, but actually where that, that might be missing the point? Well, I think uh, one of the examples of, of taking elements of an automobile and realizing that they're really products as a service, and it's like an engine is a service that provides power. But you've also got things like fuel cells, they're coming. And these fuel cells could last in, you know, for many years. And so they, we could imagine them in different vehicles. Nobody cares about that black box under the hood. But in that case, it would be supporting um, hydrogen uh, as, a, as a fuel source. So when you look at taking old engine blocks and refurbishing them and sending them back out as original equipment, the idea of reusing the steel and the iron and all the rest of it is really uh, straightforward and very effective and efficient from a production perspective. You can make money on it. You keep your customers, you keep the cars, you keep production and all those things, but you are perpetuating the internal combustion engine for another 25 years. And so if you stop and ask yourselves always during your design work, what is my intention? Where's all this going? Um, you, can, you can start to beg that question that way. And then you think, well, okay, if this is something we do in this company in order to stay afloat as a business so that we can transition into clean, healthy mobility with clean, healthy mobility services, power, use of vehicles, use of materials, you know, then it's part of your plan. If it's simply to save money and do something again, 
it's, it doesn't have that bigger intention. It's missing the fabulous. And so in that example, so we're saying people are uh, trying to um, so, you know, apply servicitization within the um, mobility sector, so engines as a service, repair and manufacture, but the ultimate uh, result of that is we just you know, have the combustion engine for longer. Say we, we're saying, okay, we need to be encouraging this switch to electrification, but in lots of, lots, many parts of the world, electric power is generated still from fossil fuels. So how, how, does, how should a, a company or how should one be kind of navigating that tension where there's huge kind of geographical context? A great point. Um, clearly, we have to bring down the chimneys. So I call it the horizontal chimneys. So there's two things to do there. One is replace them, which is going on in China right now, in the cities with geothermal, one for one, take them down, use earth heat for thermal. And it's quite astonishing to watch what's going on there uh, with the Icelanders helping. Then, uh, but the other is on the power and so on, that we can get renewable power cost effective. It's been clear for years now. And we're seeing, you know, in the Middle East, 1.78 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity from solar farms now. So we're way below the price of burning gas or coal or even, you know. So, so we're, we can see that trajectory. So therefore, the electric car really fits nicely into that system because with batteries in the cars, we did a study for one of the big industrial companies. We call it future-proofing. And we looked into the future and said, you know, airports in the future will have solar collectors all over the roofs and we'll be producing excess power during the day and what would we do with it? Oh, we would store it in the batteries in the rental fleets, of course, because where's the batteries for it? Well, they're sitting in the parking lot waiting to go somewhere. So all of a sudden, the optimization of renewable power with the batteries in mobility or even at home over time is something that's on a trajectory. So even if you go to the places where it's all fossil fuel powered right now, we can, we can see the future will, do, will be different. And, that, and if we say that the electricity will come from the lowest possible price with the best ecological footprint, et cetera, which includes social costs, environmental costs, we can definitely move towards the renewables, geothermal, wind, solar, and so on. So, and you if know, you were, it's not say, just the, what's there today. And, and just to say, if you, if you would say kind of at the helm of one of these, these you know, big kind of global manufacturers at the moment, there is a, a short-term, long-term tension in that because, of, you know, the short-term... The, the infrastructure maybe doesn't exist today, but in the long term, you know, it's coming. So when do you divest and invest, you know, to, to switch your fleet? I mean, do you, what are, your, what are your thoughts on actually business being able to navigate that, that short-term, long-term tension? Well, I think you, you put out what I call a green button. You just basically say, I'll give an example because we work with Walmart. And here we are. It's the world's biggest company in terms of employees, 2 million plus. So they... They have a goal of being 100% renewably powered. That's the goal. And it's been explicit for almost a decade. So what happens is you get these commercial actors who, who are saying we're going to be 100% renewably powered. Good. Now, when? As soon as it's cost effective because they're business. But they're searching for it all the time. So they're constantly looking for where can we get this? Where can we, how can we help? How do we get a contract for wind from Oklahoma? How can we do this? How can we do that? And they do it cost effectively. So they, they actually set the stage for everyone else to do it because they start there. So you can put it in your plan and then you execute against it. If you just say, oh, I can't afford it. I don't have time to think about it. I don't know what to do with it. Then it's not part of your plan. So getting it into the plan so the business people are actually doing it. So very famous you know, examples of this now, and these are clients, is like Google is going to be 100% renewably powered. Apple, mm. um, Facebook, I mean, they're all doing it. Why? Well, because their marketplace expects it. You know, if you're Apple and you're that smart and you're that good at design and you're that good at this stuff, well, of course you do this because you're smart and you know how to deal with technology and you know how to manage power and you know how to manage batteries. Of course you do. So it's obvious for those companies. Um, yeah. And that's what, where they're going. And I suppose that, that market signaling is hugely important because it creates the incentive 
further down the supply chain for people to invest. It makes the argument for investment decisions uh, for people who are trying to move into that space to be the, the suppliers for the Walmarts, you know, Walmart in the future and, and their energy. Walmart has created a program called the uh, Gigaton, and they're asking their suppliers to reduce their carbon emissions by a gigaton, by date certain. So they've asked every single supplier to show their carbon releases and show the release every year so they can add it to their list till they get to a gigaton. So there you go. That's how, it, that's, how, that's how the change can be kind of forced down the supply chain. So, uh, Bill, I'm going to come to you in a second with a question about your, your biggest criticism of how the uh, idea has been interpreted. But before we do, I do want to um, jump to uh, my colleague Kinga, who's got some messages on what's up next in the diff. Hi, my name is Kinga, and I'm going to tell you about my three favourite sessions coming up and available to watch. The first one is the podcast Safe and Circular by Design, Making Positive Material Choices. In a collaboration between the Alec MacArthur Foundation and Cradle to Cradle Product Innovation Institute, four new methods have been created for designers to implement materials that are safe and circular. The next one is Kelp the World, the future is seaweed. This session is about another material that we find a lot in our oceans, seaweed. What can we do with it? What advantages does it have? And will it really help us towards a better future? The third one is materials I'm making in the Diff Studio. It's one to catch up on, available on our website thinkdiff.co. Zoe Laughlin, co-founder and director of the Institute of Making, joined us in the Diff Studio and explores with us what we can do with materials. Spoiler alert, there is live experimentation going on. Those are my three top picks. Back to Joe in the studio. Okay, thanks, Kinga. Uh, Bill, we had a bit of thinking time there to, to mull this one over, so we're expecting a knockout answer. Um, but uh -oh. just, to, <laughs> just to reiterate, what, what, what is your biggest criticism of how the idea is, is being interpreted or has been? Um, the, I don't really find myself wanting to criticize on a, on a negative level. I want to find myself wanting to encourage. But I would say the places where I've been sad, as I've seen the language used, referring to activities that I would consider not consistent with the principles and the values of Cradle to Cradle are when you see things that are being advertised to, say, children or people as something that is, you know, be, being better because it's being reutilized in a certain kind of way, but the quality is going down. I hate it when I see things that are being downcycled mm -hmm. and then they're characterized as being upcycled. Oh, this is better because I took this lowly thing and made it into this thing. But they're making it as something that can never be recycled, and it's not real, you know. And that, that's what worries me. I guess you could call it greenwashing, things like that. But um, it's, it's not when you see things like that that are innocent explorations of trying to be good by being less bad. It's the, when it's actually implicitly intentional to mislead. Then I find it very disappointing. And when it's being used as a marketing hype, and it's not authentic or principled. That that does make me sad. Yeah, I, and you that, see that. That resonates. We definitely. Uh, I personally have had some conversations that that feel um, like that. I wonder, you know, even the term downcycling and the fact that that's maybe a bit more of a understood term now. Does that indicate that actually there is a broader um, you know, your, your kind of general public, people are aware that if something is just being downgraded, we're losing the value, yeah. one more iteration, is we're not really yeah. solving the problem. Well, and that's one of the great things about when the book came out, we started, you know, even, you know, framing these terms um, and, you know, calling this downcycling instead of recycling. What, what, what you look at for us is downcycling is a thing losing its quality. So it's being cycled, but it's going down in quality. So a PET, plastic bottle from which you can drink, 
is being downcycled into a flower pot or a park bench on its way to the landfill or incinerator because the quality is being lost. It's being aggregated with other things. It's no longer food grade, et cetera. Then, uh, and maybe it's even contaminated. Um, sometimes when it's used in fibers and fabrics, even fleeces, they get added dyes and you start adding zippers and you start doing all kinds of other stuff to it that actually reduces its quality. It can't be recycled again. So that kind of thing. So the, we could call it recycling, but it's really downcycling. We're losing quality. Recycling would be it comes back with a plastic bottle. But upcycling to us means you're improving its quality. The world's getting better because you just did something. So the thing went up in quality. So in terms of some of the plastics, if we remove a, a antimony, you know, a, a catalyst residue that is a contaminant and, and we purify the product coming back into the systems, even as we look forward to large-scale pyrolysis on plastics so that we can get back to the monomers and, and start over with the polymerization, we can actually pull out the sludges and, and use it to purify the material before we put it back into the system. So that's actually an upcycling of the material. It's not something. We're taking it back, decontaminating it, and then putting it out in a pure form and hopefully maintaining that purity as we design it into new things, which is the bigger picture. So that's, uh, that's really what this to us is about. Downcycling is losing quality. Recycling is doing it again. And upcycling is making it better. Did Some just... people misinterpret it, or, or not misinterpret, excuse me, have an alternative interpretation of the terminology where they'll say upcycling is, is changing its use to a higher purpose. So, you know, if you upcycle a package into a useful object, you know, the, the toy, then you're upcycling that. But if it's the same materials and they're not safe for children, you, what have you done? Have you made the world better or have you just done it, whatever we were doing before, again, in another form? So. Well, they, you hear it. That's the official definitions uh, according to, to Bill McDonough. And uh, what, one, th one thought that I had uh, as you were giving the example about um, the plastics example, if you remove one of the inputs and you create a, a, a purer stream of plastic, so you're upcycling, um, is, a, is a challenge to you know, asking people to invest in that, that actually it's very hard for them to get the economic benefit back. So if you are putting higher quality plastics out on the market and then they're being dispersed here there and everywhere and you're losing control of that material you know do you see the upside do you see the the economic benefit of that investment you've made into um making it a pure stream in the first place it's a really great question um <clears throat> these things take time and i think they have to do with culture it's about a culture so the people who have done this and textile and so on, it's about their culture. And, and their people love it, and, they, and their customers love it. And so it becomes that. And, and if that has economic benefit, so be it. Uh, we've also found that some of these things do save money. And what's happening with innovation this way is just taking out that material and using this other material turned out, in some cases, to be 20% cheaper. So you discover ways to save money because you're business people and you're trying to figure out how to get this done at the same time as you do that. But your bigger question I think, is the one that has got us all perplexed, which is if the entire system is crazy and you do all these exquisite things and they get thrown into the giant crazy system, you know, is it worth it? Or is this all just tilting at windmills? And so the beautiful thing for me about the issue, say, on the polyesters, when we first proposed, like, let's, let's move away from these, these catalysts towards these catalysts, well, now the new ones are becoming the standard. Mm. See, that's the thing. So now a lot of this, you don't need to do that purification ritual because the industry standard has shifted because attention was brought to this issue. And then companies made the alternatives, you know, using titanium instead of antimony or something. And then all of a sudden, now the alternatives are available, and they're cost-effective, and they become the standard. That's why I'm saying it isn't even a regulatory framework. It's a standard. And people just say, oh, there's a higher quality, and it's cost-effective. Let's use that instead. And that's how the world gets better, because we're here, not because we're screaming at each other. 
Yeah. It goes, goes back to your opening point around the importance of standards, the rules, the rules of the game. Yeah. But those first yeah. movers, those leading examples can, uh, you know, set the direction for the standards right. to, to come in their wake. Yeah, in the same way that bad actors try to preserve the playing field for themselves by saying, it's okay to do this, to pollute this river this way, because it's the standard. It's the way we do things. It's the regulatory minimum, whatever it is. Mm. So we, we're just looking at the flip side of that, which is that if businesses can do the right things efficiently, then they can say to people, this is a, and the regulators can say, this is a benchmark. This is something you can do. So when people say, oh, it's impossible, the two answers to that I love. One is Dean Kamen, the inventor of Segway. When somebody in his studio says, you know, that's impossible, he says to them, don't tell me it's impossible, just tell me you can't do it. And then, and then he'll say, do you need help? You know, can we get to a team? You know, should we give it to someone else? Uh, you know, it's just keep going. And I think that's, that's part of what this is about. Let's all do this. And the other is Leibniz, you know, who famously wrote that if it, if it is possible, therefore it exists. And so our job is to make it exist. Therefore it is possible. So people can emulate it and make it a standard. Yeah, I really like that point. I think that resonates that everyone wants to see someone else do it and then they, they will they will follow. But there really are some leaders of the pack and, and some um, some people are making moves. You mentioned Ecovative and, and Eben and the packaging. They're demonstrating that you can find a substitute. You don't have to use polystyrene and it can work in a, a big supply chain like, like Dell's, for example. Right. Well, well, I just wanted to pick up on this... Um, uh, this kind of open loop versus closed loop, um, you know, tension. So we were talking about the idea of putting high, healthier materials out there and that, that can, you know, be a, a mark to, for, for, for regulators or, or standards to, to follow. But do you, um, do you see uh, that the, 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 there is an, the, the future, or the way we get there is through this kind of open loop feeding the system dynamic or this kind of closed loop trying to this product as a service trying to keep control um, dynamic or actually is that a moot point it's 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 both I think it comes back to this issue of use that that we're talking about human artifice and if we look at the history of of even manufacturing as a friend of mine points out in uh, uh, in discussing manufacturing, that manufacturing comes from hand-made, man, man mm -hmm. manufacturing, human hand-making. And so we start with weaving and so on, and knotting and making brick, and then we move to manufacturing, which really could have been machine factoring, mills in Manchester, and looms. Then we move to robot factoring, now we have 3D machines making things. And we move on to to uh, you know what we're seeing today with 3D, we're what we're seeing with you know uh, uh, machine learning, and as we move into artificial intelligence and AI, we realize that all this is moving towards a kind of world of statistical significance that operates based on statistical significance. And so, when do we bring back human intelligence or natural intelligence to go with artificial intelligence? You, know, you can't just have one; you have to have the opposite. So. What is that? When do we bring wisdom to the smart? When I hear people say, I'm designing a smart building, I'll go, well, is it wise? You know, if it's smart, that's nice. It's statistically significant. It's got its temperature under control. But is it nice? Is it cheerful? Does it bring your life joy? It's like all these things about wisdom that go with, with human experience. And so I think it's something we have to figure out how to combine those two things. And it's the same with this other issue, I think. There are open systems, there are closed systems. There's, there's ephemeral things. When I was a child we, in Japan, our candy was rice candy and milk candy. And you, it was wrapped in rice paper in a box. And so when you wanted the candy, you took it out of the box, you threw it in your mouth. And the rice paper just dissolved. It was a really fun experience, mm -hmm. sort of gooey, sweet. And then the, if you give it to a friend with your grubby little fingers, they take off the rice paper 
because they and then they just eat the candy and throw the rice paper on the ground. And it's almost like saying, please litter. It's beautiful. So for little kids, it's fun. You have this little rectangle of rice going onto the ground, and the next time it rains, it just whoosh, turns into soil. I'm neat. So there, there's ephemera. That's something designed for the open system of nature itself. And on the other hand, when we have these technical materials, plastics, metals, and so on, those really do want to be in closed systems that are, that are taking the materials back and putting them back into use. So we have the whole range. We have to design into that. That's the principal design of credit cradle design. And I suppose it really just comes out to that point of intent. You know, what is it that you are designing? What is it you're putting out there into the system on the market? And, you know, what type of product is it a kind of something that is a sweet that will be consumed in five seconds? Or is it a, is it a car or a phone that would have a, a longer lifespan? You mentioned... In to your, your point, Joe, let me, let me you just signal something that's a real head buster for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. What happens when humans come up with clever stuff? The, the reason intention is so important. Being from Japan, you know, the, the, the atom bomb was a real issue for me as a child. I mean, I was born in 1951. We, Hiroshima was like a few years earlier, right there. So, so why was Einstein afraid? And what is that? So when we start looking at AI, why is Elon Musk afraid? Huh. You know, like, wait a minute, we have tools and they make us afraid. Why? Because humans are very strange about use. When you have something, you think about the value of a tool is put there by the intention of the user. It's here for our use. So if I give you a hammer and it, you give it to a child, it becomes a toy. If you give it to a carpenter, it becomes your house. If you give it to a maniac, it becomes a weapon. So no matter what you're doing, you know, the fundamental question becomes, are you designing a weapon? And you may not intentionally be designing a weapon, but things get weaponized. So there's some range of, of human experience where as designers, certain things we can do and certain things we can't do. I, I spent time a week at Auschwitz in Birkenau as I was working on a memorial and I decided the memorial should be the thing itself, and we should preserve it. There was, it didn't need any artifice. It just was its own memorial. Just preserve it. Don't let it disappear so we don't forget. But when I was there, I realized there were engineers that were hired to design a place that was there to, you know, cremate bodies, that was there to, to exterminate people. And that who worked on that design? It was implicitly and explicitly a death machine. So when do you say no? When you say, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you're working on something that might become problematic and you know it, when do we have negligence? When do we, negligence is proven by knowing better and doing the wrong thing anyway. At what point do we find ourselves being negligent? So when I look out at the people that are in this audience and I just imagine you out there and I say, oh, welcome to our world, you know, this is a really amazing tribe of people who are so well-intentioned and so interested in the future and so well-meaning. And they're looking for jobs or they're looking for new ways to design things or they're, they're looking for a package or they, or they want to learn business this way, all those things. It's really wonderful because your intentions are so critical here. And um, these are the things that you have to process. And, and I go for those things that, that give you the most bliss and have the least potential for weaponization. More bliss, less weaponization. Um, but I, 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 I think it's you know, very pertinent, the, the, um, some of the messages there. You mentioned AI uh, twice there. It, it sounds like that's something you feel uh, is a topic we, we really need to um, engage this thinking in, or the people who are working on our AI need to be considering more intent. Um, we have a question from the audience, uh, Jojo M, online. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'm leading you down this route, but uh, Jojo M says, where do you see the most opportunity for acceleration of cradle-to-cradle -cradle concepts over the next 10 years? You know, is artificial intelligence an area actually could 
uh, really accelerate some of this thinking and the application of this thinking? Yeah, great question. In AI, I would say, especially since we have the blockchain and, uh, and we have artificial intelligence, that um, if we look at artificial intelligence as the, the high-speed management of statistical significance, um, and then we ask ourselves, how do we put values into the tool? Because if all it does is take number, it's like we were talking about earlier with efficiency, if all we're doing is number, the less, the more, we're not dealing with our values, the good, the bad, right? So there's a difference between the right and the wrong and the less and the more. But if statistical significance doesn't know what is right, it knows what is less, what is more. And so the question of right is the values question. So I think if we're working in AI, we can start to integrate values into the statistical significance so that we still can have a good, bad switch, not just a less, more switch or a zero, one switch. We can have one, should I do this or not do this switch, you know, kind of thing. That would be really elegant. So that we can start to drive it toward the world we want, not the world that we get as a, as a result of having no plan. And then the other thing I think we'll see in the next 10 years, I'm going after it full speed, and I know the Al MacArthur Foundation is going after it, everybody, is that we've got the plastics in the ocean now. So it's now in our faces. So we've been talking about all these things for years, and now everybody sees it. Climate change is hard to see. It's not so hard to experience right now, but it was hard to see for a long time. Mm. But this plastic's in the ocean. Every, the plastics are in our face. So I think we're going to see in 10 years, I think we can use the tools of artificial intelligence. We can use the blockchain. We can use all kinds of forms of wisdom and intelligence now to go after this full tilt and just respect each other for not knowing what to do because everybody's making stuff up. And there are things that look like big hobby plans and they're the things that look like really intelligent little pieces of the puzzle. It's a fantastic moment. So more the merrier, pile on, let's go get this thing done. And I think that will get the, the fast moving consumer goods companies. They've got their attention. You know, <laughs> we definitely have their attention. And, uh, you know, I work with a lot of them. So the, it's time. That's when we just have to all, all get at. Yeah. And in the process, we'll get at these tools and get at these principles and get at these systems. And um, that's, I mean, something that, you know, just going back to this market signals that you mentioned earlier through the new plastics economy work and the global commitment. So, there, you know, there are big commitments that are being made. There are signals that are being made to the market that um, actually the industry recognises the need to shift uh, and the need to uh, find, find better solutions. So, Bill, we're coming towards the end of our time. I wanted to try and circle us back uh, to, to kind of where we opened and just recognize that, you know, this is an area you have been working in for some time. Um, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe 30 years since the book uh, was published? 40. 40. 40 years since the book was, was published. Um, I'm, oh, no, I, the book was published in 2002. 2002. Okay, someone, someone can do the maths. Um, so I, I, what I'm, I would love to hear from you is, is how you're feeling about the moment that we're in now. Uh, you know, in in relative to that journey that you've been on over over the past 30, 40 years, are you repeating the same conversations constantly, or do you think we're in a in a different moment? How would you characterise uh, where we are today? Well, I do find myself saying the same things over and over again, but that's okay because it's always um, it's always it's always quizzical because you're always applying it to something that's in the, in the present. I think the issues for me are that I concern myself with, specifically right now, is that the global GDP is approaching $100 trillion. So it's, it's like 85 or something. The global financial markets are approaching a quadrillion, a thousand trillion. So it's 10 to one. So if we look at the GDP, it's goods and then goods with value add, and then you have services. So if that's a hundred trillion, the whole thing, that's the real world, so to speak, at least part of it that's measured with money that way. But then the 90% 
his derivative. It has nothing to do with anything. Real. It's trading. Everything's just trading around. So we've created an economy that is essentially different than when I started. Because when I started, Wall Street's secret was the creation of the perception of scarcity where none exists. People would say, oh, you got to get on this before it disappears. You know, invest here. Try this, try that. Now it's different. It's the creation of the perception of scarcity where nothing exists. Oh, my goodness. So there's so much money and so little reality. So the idea is at this moment in time, we really need to get that financial market with all the money in it, focus on these things. Because a great time to get investment in these things because people are looking for things to invest in. So why wouldn't you want to invest in a positive future for all generations? So I think, I think that's one of the big stories right now, is that this is the greatest place to invest there is because it's real. And uh, I think a lot of people are, are starting to recognize that. Mm. that. Yeah, very wise words. And, and something that I've heard recently from someone working in a, in a kind of major pension fund um, on the topic of investing into these types of uh, initiatives, businesses, is that there's a shift in perception happening from thinking about the cost of investing in, in circular solutions to the cost of not investing. And, and that um, is a real dynamic that could play out in those, um, in those financial markets and actually just change uh, the way people are looking at risk and opportunity. Exactly. They're, they're working from fear. So because you're working from fear and de-risking. They're worried about not investing in it. They're, gonna, they're worried they're going to miss out. That's, that's that creation of perception of scarcity where it not exists. Excellent. Bill, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your uh, hectic schedule. Uh, in summary for our, our audience, um, don't work from fear. Design with intent. Uh, design for effectiveness over efficiency and overall be more fabulous. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.